so thank you all for joining us. Um, I just wanted to show you the course, the schedule for what we're going to be doing today um, and do a little bit of housekeeping to get started. Um, so let me share my screen. So you know where to find this because you got the Zoom link from here. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have um, some introduction from Chris about how to use Maxima. Then there will be a bit of getting your hands dirty. So we'll send you into breakout groups to do a task. Um, I think it will be useful to cut your teeth on it and we'll be circulating to, to give you a hand if you get stuck. Um, we'll have a break and then after the break, we're going to shift focus. So the, the first half, we're really thinking about getting the questions up and running. So how do you write a question, um, potentially using the randomization features in, in Maxima? Um, how do you write a good work solution using the features of Maxima? And then after the break, we're shifting focus to what do you do after that? So once you start getting students' answers in, um, how do you tell if their answers are correct? And so there's some Maxima tips there from me. Um, and also what happens if um, you've got problems? How, are you, how do you go about debugging um, issues with Maxima? Um, there is a, a question and answer forum here as well. So I think rather than, if, you know, if you've got a quick question, pop it in the Zoom chat. But if you've got something that's a bit more technical, um, we can use this discussion forum during today. Um, and that will give us a chance to not lose any questions and give you a more considered response in there. Um, and there will be resources appearing um, as we go through. So the course page will be useful. We'll be fleshing this out with the, the video from today and also various stuff that you'll have access to afterwards. So keep that open in a, a tab as we get started on the first part. OK, so I think um, I'll hand over now to, to Chris to get us started, um, unless there are any questions at this point. Not much to ask about. <laughs> Okay, thanks, so everyone. Chris, yeah. Going. yeah, well, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm going to start off by just talking a little bit about Maxima itself, because underneath Stack is this existing computer algebra system. Um, I can't quite remember, I don't know the whole history of Maxima, but I think it goes back to the 70s. Um, there were three big computer algebra systems right from the word go, Maple, Mathematica, and Maxima. And at some point, Maxima went bust, and the academics who'd been working on it um, got the correct code and permission to release it, and it went back a few steps, and that forked off into what we now have as Maxima. And it's a perfectly, um, it's a perfectly decent piece of desktop software. To the extent, I think, the Open University now recommend it as their, um, as their computer algebra system. Um, now, it doesn't have the flashy interface that... Um, you would expect on a modern piece of software. In fact, if I go to my, uh, if I just go, go in here somewhere and have a look, uh, let's just get a terminal up. Right, this is Maxima. Right, and it does that, and it just doesn't look very good. So almost nobody uses Maxima. Um, there is a much better piece of software called WX Maxima, which has this kind of widgets interface to Maxima. So this is a, a layer on top of Maxima. On the server, we're using the other, you know, the, just the plain, the plain actual application. So I'm just going to demonstrate this with, with, um, with WX Maxima. So let's type in an expression. V is uh, four thirds times pi times R cubed. Okay, so that's an expression in Maxima. Uh, and then if we define R to be 30, that's the value. So a semicolon on the end of a line displays the result, a dollar sign evaluates it and doesn't. Um, the colon is assigning a value to a variable. So if I type R semicolon, it will display the value of R, which we've defined to be 30. If I actually evaluate V, it's still pi r cubed, right? It, it hasn't re-evaluated the expression. Um, that's different from simplification because but there's a kind of subtle difference between simplification and evaluation. But if we evaluate v again, 
what that will do is it will reevaluate the expression uh, and now r has a value it will substitute the value for the expression and, and simplify the result okay so that's maxima um, and uh, actually everything in maxima is an expression okay so if i type in uh, m is a matrix Um, that's an expression as well, right? So what we have is we have the matrix constructor function and the arguments of the constructor function have to be lists of identical length, right? So, um, yeah. So everything in maxima is an expression and an expression is an operator with its arguments. So the operator of M is the matrix constructor function and the arguments of M are the list of lists. All right. Okay. So if we think about V, um, if we go back up to our original expression up here, this was a product of things, right? So the operator of V will be, oh, so no, it's division. Okay. So it has simplified it to, yeah, the top operator here is division. And the arguments of V will be the numerator and the denominator, right? And if we take the first of the arguments of V and we look at the operator of that, percentage in the desktop session is the previous expression you've just evaluated, then that is now a product, right? It's a product of things. Okay, so you can pick apart expressions. Now, absolutely everything in Maxima is an expression. So a programming construct is also an expression, okay? So if we have a block with a local variable, uh, let's use R, and then we do um, R is uh, 20 uh, R cubed, what that does is um, it defines a local variable, it, evaluate, it assigns that local variable the value 20, and then it returns the last expression in the block, okay? But this is as much a expression as everything else is an expression. And now if we reevaluate R, it's gone back to 30 because the value R is 20 was just local to that block, okay? So everything, including program constructs, are expressions in Maxima. Um, and that's, that's really, um, that's kind of really important and, and useful. Right, so that's expressions and operators and arguments. And I don't really want to talk too much about evaluation uh, and how evaluation works, because that's probably something that is best uh, if you want to find out how all that works, what order things are evaluated in and, and function evaluation, all this kind of stuff. Then there is a very nice document called Minimal Maxima, which we will link to from this website and it's 20 pages and it really does tell you the, the, the minimum things that you probably need to know. And in here, I've just gone through some of these examples in here so far, there is a whole section on um, evaluation, right? And the order of evaluation and all this kind of stuff, right? So we're, not, we're just not gonna go through that today. So that's, please, please look at that. Okay, now, I've mentioned um, about operators and arguments, and operators and arguments um, just operate at the top level of the expression. But actually, if we type question mark print v, we can look inside and see the whole expression. And this, this is a kind of terrifying internal representation of what's going on. And expressions are trees. So I'm just going to try and unpick this a little bit, okay? So simp means that, um, right, so this is, maxima itself is written in Lisp, right? And everything in Lisp is a list. So basically what this says is, uh, let's do it, let's maybe do a simpler one. Let's do x plus one, right? Let's do that. So what this is saying uh, in a very terse way is that we have the sum of one and x. Right, so maxima has some special internal way of um, saying that is the variable lowercase x, right? And it's saying that it's already simplified its arguments 
So you don't need to keep resimplifying everything, but we don't need to know about that too much, right? But basically that is what one plus X is. And so what's this? It is the top level is times. So it is a product of, uh, then we've rash, we've got a ra ratio. So that is the division of four and three. And then we have got, so we've got the product of, yeah, pi and uh, r cubed, haven't we? So that's the exponent of r and three. So I'm just sort of writing it out a bit. So we have got a product of things. So these are the things we've got the product of. And then each, some of those are just atoms and some of them are expressions, right? Okay, so the simplest kind of expression is an atom. Um, and atoms are things like what uh, numbers or floating point numbers or, um, or variables. But V is not an atom, V is an expression, okay? Because it's got an operator in its arguments. Yeah. Um, how do we define uh, functions in maxima? Um, so functions in maxima are defined with colon equals. So we've got three, we've got equal, equals is overloaded in maths, okay? So we've got R is defined to be the value 30. That is assigning a value to a variable. Um, we have got um, an equation yet to be solved. So the operator of that expression is the equal sign, okay? And the equal sign is an operator, right? Okay, fine. Um, and then we have f of x is defined to be x squared. That now uh, defines a function. And when a function is evaluated, it you know, evaluates to the definition of the function. And the operator of f is, um, uh, I probably have to do that. No. Um, Okay, let's leave that. And then the last example is, um, yeah, true equals false, right? We can use um, equals as a binary function, right? That uh, on Boolean values. Now that doesn't work, so we would have to reevaluate that with a, an is, okay? And that will then evaluate the equality as a as a binary function. Okay. So that's the kind of um, really, really maxima, um, maxima 101. Now, it's a, there's a question yep. in the chat, Chris. The, Which I'm not the, monitoring, so thanks for jumping in. Yeah. yeah, the question mark print, is that one operator or two operators? Right, okay. Now I don't wanna to get too much into that. Um, so underneath ma maxima is really just a set of Lisp macros because nobody wants to use Lisp, <laughs> right? I mean, mathematicians think, you know, we, we have ways of typing mathematical expressions that we're used to, okay? And we don't want to think in terms of Lisp. So when you type question mark in Maxima, what you're executing is a Lisp statement. You're just going underneath to Lisp. So this is print the, the value, you know, that's a, that's a Lisp function that will show you what's going on under the hood, okay? And I, I, again, please just read more about that. Um, this is not available in, uh, through, through the website, right? This is not available through Stack. We don't give you any access to Lisp through Stack, okay? Um, right, now, the reason I chose Maxima when I started this was because it's free, right? Uh, and it, it, I, I dug around and I looked at all the, op I looked at all the computer algebra systems. The first, the first software that I know of that was using a, a mainstream computer algebra system in this way was called AIM. It was written by Theodore Kolkolnikov in uh, the late 1990s, I think, 1997, 1998. And it was written in Maple. The whole thing was written in Maple, right? And we used that very successfully in Birmingham for many years. I think um, there was a big overlap between AIM and Stack because we had a load of legacy materials. And um, there was Neil Strickland, at, um, uh, who's now head of department at um, Sheffield, um, wrote the second version of AIM, and it was hugely reliable software, and it was excellent, except Maple's not free. And it was kind of clear to me that um, 
that was going to be a problem uh, in the sense that we would, we would need to pay license fees. So in the early days, Maple were very easy going and said, sure, well, all your students are paid for a license. That's fine. Morally, you're doing, you're, you're okay. So I, I cast around and looked for various different computer algebra systems and I thought about writing my own. Um, and I used Axiom originally, uh, which is um, designed for uh, pure mathematics. And I really liked Axiom. Um, but in the end, I chose Maxima. And, um, and I, you know, I chose that because it seemed to be uh, the best of the free computer algebra systems. And what I didn't realize at the time was that Maxima, I think, is essentially unique in a computer algebra world in being able to uh, turn simplification off. So if you type question mark space simp, that's not a Lisp command. Yeah, this is a really subtle thing. This accesses the help system. Okay, so that tells you about the command, right? So if you want to find out about what a Maxima command does, that's the inbuilt help file. And uh, this is a, a global variable uh, and its default is true and it enables simplification. So in Maxima, um, if you type simp false, and then you type an expression, it doesn't do anything. Yep. Which uh, isn't that, <laughs> doesn't really look that useful if, um, if you're trying to do a calculation, which is what most people do normally with a computer algebra system. But it turns out to be precisely the kind of thing that we need to do to be able to have a, an expression that we can, we can manipulate fully, right? If you want to evaluate that, we can evaluate the previous expression with simplification on, and we can then have selective simplification of that command, okay? Um, and there is a subtle difference in maxima between evaluation and simplification, which I'm not gonna go into, okay? So the, the evaluation rules do things like substituting values into functions, and the simplification rules do other things, right? So I'll le leave you all to read up on the difference between evaluation and simplification, which I have to say, I don't fully understand all the subtleties of this, right? And I think over the last half century or however long Maxima um, has been in development, there have been a lot of people writing bits of Maxima code and it may have somewhat lost its clarity of vision. So let me just say that and um, there we are. Okay, so it is what it is and that's what we're using and uh, I'm very grateful to all the folks who continue to support Maxima. There is a big Maxima community and they're very responsive and very, very helpful, um, right? So um, yeah. Okay, so let me just show you a few more kind of Maxima functions. Uh, if I remember to share my screen. Okay. So uh, one of the Maxima functions is, um, oh yeah, let me just uh, say a few more things about built-in data types. So Maxima is very, very loosely typed. Okay. The re that, in fact, that was the reason I gave up with Axiom, because Axiom is extremely strongly typed, right? So in, in Axiom, you, ca you, can't, you can have a list of floats, right? But you can't have a list with an integer and a float in it, because that's got mixed data types. So Axiom just turned out to be hugely problematic, and I would have had to have rewritten whole sections of it, which is why I gave up with Axiom, okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong with Axiom. I quite like hard typing. It, has, it definitely has its benefits, but we need to deal with um, messy things that students type, right? So we do need to deal with a mess. And um, Axiom wouldn't let you do that. And that was a problem. Okay, so this, this, uh, this is a list. And uh, the operator is the uh, list constructor function. Right, so you can, um, you can create lists of things and you can map. So if I call, there's a function called map and I've got my x, I've got my, um, I've got my f squared function, haven't I? So if I map f to l, it will just um, take a function and apply it to every element of the list. Now, um, Here is a general expression ex1, and you can also map functions onto expressions. Okay. Right. And that sort of does what you would expect it to do. The arguments of, you know, it is applying that function to the arguments of the expression, right? So that's what map does. 
Um, so that's kind of useful because a lot of what we'll need to do is to um, what a lot we will what, a lot of what we will do is uh, is need to um, manipulate expressions. Okay, so we will need to take expressions apart and play about with them and find out bits of them and uh, 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 and do things to them. Okay, so that's kind of quite a common thing to do. So um, we can map things to expressions, but we could do that in another way as well. What we could do is we could take, um, we could make a list of expressions. So I could say uh, L1 is the args of EX1, and that would give me the list of things. And then we could map F to L1. Now we've got a list of things. And then how do we get back to a sum? Well, we can apply uh, the addition operator to uh, the previous expression, and then we would sum the elements of the list. So apply just takes the list constructor function and replaces it with the summing function, right? Because that's expressions. If you think about an expression tree, you're literally just taking out one function from the root of the tree and sticking in another one, okay? And we could do that, um, we can do that with L1, right? We can apply the uh, set constructor function to L1, and we will no longer have a, a, a list, we've got a set, because all a set is is a, an expression that has the set constructor function as its operator, right? That is a set. Um, now, what does the, the, the list constructor function doesn't actually do anything. Uh, the set constructor function removes duplicates from the list when simplification is on, right? That's what the set constructor function does. Okay, so that's sort of dealing, dealing with expressions and, um, and uh, all the rest of it. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah, so the last thing I want to mention here are predicate functions, because what, a lot of what we want to do is to test things. Okay, so predicate functions um, are functions which return true or false. So there are lots of type predicate functions, and most, most predicate functions in Maxima end with a P. That's a kind of Maxima convention. So set is the set constructor function, and set P is a function which is a predicate which decides if the expression is a set. So if we do set P to the previous expression, that's true. Set P to L1, which is a list, that's false, right? So the predicate functions, um, so there's list P, and there's equation P, I think. Right, okay, so that's a, so that's a good one. Right, so um, equation P is not a maxima function, but I've added it to stack because it's annoying not to have it, right? Why do you not have it? Um, so there are some subtle differences when you use stack of things that are not in maxima. And I guess I should sit down in my copious free time and send this and get it into maxima core. Because it's jolly annoying when you cut and paste code from a question into a desktop session and half the functions don't exist. We'll come back to that. But I think I should contribute more stuff back to Maxima really at some point because there are things like that that I don't understand why they haven't just put them in. Okay, and then there are some other significant differences. Maxima has a, um, a plot2d command. Uh, have I done that wrong? Right. Um, now, for obvious reasons, we can't, uh, you know, we can't have pop-up windows on the web server. So there are some things that we've done. We've, we, we have on, on stack, we have a plot command, right? Um, and that is a wrapper for the plot2d command, which will, um, you know, there was some, some file, temporary file created on my computer, and the plot command makes sure that that temporary file gets shown on the web page in the right sort of way, okay? Yeah, so that's basically how it works. Um, and that brings me on to how Stack is connected up to Maxima. So if I come on to the, if I come on to here, and we go to a, um, let's go to just any old Stack question. So I'm nipping into the demonstration quiz, uh, I'm just going to go to a stack question. 
And here is the question tests and deployed variants link. Right at the bottom of this page is this send to the CAS link, okay? And if you click on that, what this does is it gives you a page with the question variables in it, okay? It gives you the question variables and the work solution. And I added this page because when you're writing the work solution, you want to be able to send this to the computer algebra system, um, you know, and you want to be able to do things like, uh, hello world, right? And send that to the computer algebra system and read the output with all your question variables in it. So this is cast text. We've got the values of the variables in here and you can see we've got a problem, right? So in here, um, we're gonna use the variable x using the substitution x minus seven. Okay, well, what if the variable a was actually now, we do a random version that's minus five, okay, right? Okay, we've now got a problem, haven't we? And this is a problem I'm sure all of you have had at some point, and we're gonna talk about how to, to deal with that problem. But this page is a very useful page for playing about and getting a, um, direct, a direct connection to the CAS, right? A direct, direct connection to the CAS. Um, and so you can use this, and then when, when you have uh, updated your question variables, there's no way, uh, this, is, this is sort of slightly outside the main Moodle stream of things. So this is actually a dead end page. There's no way to go back anywhere from here, right? You can't even go back to the question. So you have to cut this. Um, oh, I've lost my, I've even lost my demo page, haven't I? That was a bit silly. I should have opened this in a new window. You would then have to, um, Right, let's imagine I was editing this question. You would then have to cut and paste these back into your, into your question variables here, okay? So that's just because this is outside the workflow, but it gives you very convenient access to uh, how Maxima is connected up to the web server and allows you to play about and test things out. So if we go back to our example, we can have L1 is um, A comma B comma C and L2, is uh, 1 comma 2 comma 3 and if we want to um, define a function in here that's okay and so what we can do in here is that we can map f to l2 right and that is mapping the cube function onto this list and this this auto simplify is literally uh, just setting that variable in maxima, right? There's actually, um, it, it, yeah, it just literally sets that variable, okay? It doesn't do anything else. So there's no real mystery to all of this. Um, so if we do that, what it will have done in here is it will have evaluated, right? So map f to L2 applies the function and evaluates the function, but it doesn't do the simplification. And this is a very useful thing that we might want to do for creating steps in a work solution, right? So if you're creating steps in a work solution, you can switch the simplification off and you can build up, uh, build up the expression you want. And then later on, um, well, if I'm gonna use this twice, I, might, I, I can put any maxima expression in here. This is cast text. And again, literally what happens is you set the simplification, then you create this list of variables then you add on this list of variables that occur in the cast text. You evaluate the whole thing, and then you display the values of any of the things that you need to display. So the LaTeX goes in here. Um, uh, you can also get the, the actual string out. So you may not remember this from the docs, but there is the, um, oh, let's turn the simplification off. This is literally the, maybe I do, maybe I do a non-trivial one. Okay, right? So this shows you the LaTeX and this shows you the Maxima statement. So if you're sending something to JavaScript, you don't want the LaTeX, you want the Maxima expression. So you can get both of these in your cast text. Um, so let's imagine you're creating your work solution. Um, what you want to do, if we're gonna use this twice, you might as well take it out and create a, a, a variable with that in it. 
So now we can just have the value of that variable, but then here we could evaluate C1. Okay, and we'll get, um, we've now evaluated that with simplification, or maybe up here we could apply um, We're going to multiply the values of those lists together. And so that's one, one cubed times two cubed times three cubed. And then when we simplify it, of course, when we simplify this top level thing, it will simplify the whole expression, right? So you'll have to think about how you could simplify uh, only one step in, right? But we'll come back to that. So there is a... Um, there is another function which I have defined in stack, which is not in maxima, called zip with. Okay. So we'll call this we'll call this expression C two, uh, and I'm going to zip with uh, product of uh, L one and L two. Okay. So let's um, just show you what that does. And some of you may be familiar with the idea of zipping up two lists with a binary function, but it does exactly what you would expect. It takes the first two elements and applies the binary function, which we said was multiply. And then it takes the next two elements. So it returns a list where they're zipped together. They literally zip together. Okay, and this, this zip with is a really very, very useful function, I find. And it's really annoying that there isn't a maxima version. So if we now, if we now cut and paste this into our maxima session, right? It does everything except zip with is not defined and anything which is not defined is just returned unevaluated, right? It's just a function zip with, um, and we haven't defined zip with. So that's a little bit, a little bit annoying. Um, okay, so let me just stop and pause there. Are there any other a couple of things in the chat? Um, Yep, yeah, you can replace, yeah, so you can replace that, you can just re keep replacing backwards and forwards to your heart's content, Sam, if you want to, that's fine. Any other questions about, um, about this so far? Yeah, sorry, you answered that after I asked it, so it's fine. I withdraw my question. Anything else? I appreciate I'm rattling through this at a fair old, fair old rate of knots, so yeah, sorry, folks. Um, okay. Does your zip with do like what you might call broadcasting in Python? Can you use it to apply a scalar to a matrix? Um, well, it rather depends on what the binary function does. Oh, I don't know. I don't really understand what you mean by I don't. I'm not really a big Python person. I just mean if you don't, if you've got, if you've got a list of one elements and a list of three elements, does it? scale the list of one element to match the list of three elements that you're applying it to? Uh, no, it just gives up gracefully. Okay. Um, that, was, that was my design decision, right? So it goes the other way, it prunes it, prunes it down. Uh, yeah, I guess there's three choices, aren't there? You pad the list, you, um, you prune the list, or you throw an error. Um. <laughs> I, at some point, I made a decision. I don't know what. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, right. Okay. So let me. Um, oh, I should have shared the screen there because I did the, did the I did the thing. Right. So there. There. I've I've pruned that list. I've pruned the list, and it's uh, zip, zipped with, and it's just given up gracefully. Okay. So the docs. Um, There are two ways to find the docs. The first thing is that the docs are distributed with the source code. And um, many years ago, I just got fed up of people vandalizing public wikis and, um, and trying to maintain an accurate documentation site that was separate from the source code. And basically, I want to be able to document things as I go along and make those documents public. So the source code, uh, comes with the documentation 
And um, the documentation actually serves two completely separate purposes. And, um, you know, it's a thankless, it is a thankless task, writing documentation, frankly, folks. Um, but I, I am pretty diligent and I do document things as I go along. And so the, the two purposes, one is a tutorial purpose, and that's things like the author quick start guide. And the other one is the, um, is the reference version, okay, is, is a reference version. Um, and uh, I've sort of given up sending email replies to people. Um, I generally now, um, if it's, I mean, often it's in the docs. So I'll just say, as you'll no doubt remember from reading the docs, that's my kind of modal reply to my colleagues in Edinburgh. Or I'll put it in the docs and then rather cheekily say, as you will no doubt recall from reading the docs, right? So one way or the other, it will end up in the docs. Um, so please, please, if you, if you come up with uh, clever ways of doing something or interesting things, please put them in the docs, right? So let me show you a little bit more around the documentation system because there is a lot in there and it, here we have the documentation, there's a lot of it. So there's stuff about authoring questions, answer tests, uh, you know, what is CAS text? So this really is about the design of CAS text. And this is a kind of top level thing about how to include LaTeX, how to include stuff and all this kind of thing, right? So that's part of the documentation. But then another part of the documentation down here is the real uh, computer algebra system side of it. So this, this documents the things which I've added to Maxima. And in particular, things like matrices. Um, no, that's the wrong one, I wanted matrix. There we are, okay. So matrices and vectors in stack. Um, you know, all this kind of basic stuff. So this is, this is an example of uh, where somebody did something really silly and um, there is a much more elegant way to do it at the level of mathematics. And uh, I won't name names, but um, uh, some students were writing questions at another institution. This is about 15 years ago now, so this is a very long time ago, but people were writing um, questions at another institution and they were spending ages with if then statements, right? So if, this is, this is exactly the maxima problem. This is exactly the problem um, that we're trying to solve here. So right, let's go back and just solve this problem. So N1 is uh, three and N2 is minus four. And um, you know, you're, you're writing some cast text, find N1 plus, N2, right? I mean, you, you, you can see immediately what's going to happen. Right? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a basic problem that we have to solve. And the way to solve it is very simply to solve it by uh, creating an expression, a proper mathematical expression, okay? So we've got, if we have auto-simplify on, then of course the evaluation of that expression will evaluate the expression, whereas actually we want to show the unsimplified expression. But Maxima sorts out this unary minus thing for you, okay, basically. So that is the way to solve this problem, is to switch simplification off and try and solve the problem at the mathematical level. So let's come back to the docs and think about how we would provide this feedback to students, right? And we don't want to be, we do not want to be, so what, what people were doing before were things like this. Um, so if N2 is greater or equal to zero, then print a plus sign, else print a minus sign, right? And sure enough, uh, that will print your minus sign or your plus sign. Yeah, and so if you try and solve this problem at the level of display, right, what, what, what tech symbol do I need to produce to do this? By all means, you can solve it at the level of display if you want to. Right? You know, and we've still got a double minus there, so I probably have to do uh, abs n in here, don't I, right? There we go, we solved. Uh, Oh, and I have to evaluate that with simplification. 
there we go. So we've solved the problem at the level of display, right? We've, we've created, we have assembled from the individual latex strings, we have assembled from the individual latex strings the latex string that we wanted. And if you do that, you will have a miserable and wretched time, right? This is not, this is not the design. The, the, the whole design is to have a proper mathematical expression and deal with the mathematical expression, right? That, that, that's the whole idea of what I wanted to achieve with this design. So it is much better to switch simplification off and to try and construct the expression that you want. So let's just go through this matrix example, right? From the docs. So we've got two matrices. Um, well, let's just, let's just copy and paste the whole thing. Right. And... Uh, you need to show us your screen. Yeah, yeah, I'm just... Uh, right, okay, thanks. Okay, so we've got our matrices, A plus B. And we want to, we want to give that worked feedback, okay? So um, lambda in maxima is an unnamed function. Right, so if I've got a list L1, which is one, two, three, four, and I want to square all those numbers, I don't need to create the function uh, separately. What I can do is I can map an unnamed function, which has a single argument and returns the square of that argument to L1, right? Okay. So what I have done is I have, so this lambda expression is an unnamed function, right? And that's very useful. So if we dig into this, what on earth is going on? Okay, so the first thing is that we're taking the args of A. So if we just have the args of A, instead of having the matrix constructor function, that will return a list of lists, right? So here we have got two lists of lists. And then we're going to zip with an unnamed function, which adds together the corresponding elements of those lists, right? Right, so let's just take that a bit slowly. If we just go to that level, uh, oh, and I need to do zip with. If we, if we zip with this unnamed function, what will we get? We will get, oh, I need to turn simplification off, sorry. Right, what we will have done is we will have created, um, Yeah, so this, this unnamed function has a zip with inside it. And what this zip with inside does is it takes the, the, the list of lists and it takes corresponding lists of lists and adds them together, right? And then what we need to do is we've got a list now and we now need to apply the matrix function to that list of lists. So we won't have lists anymore, we'll be back to a matrix. So when we add in our C, Right, we've now got those matrix with the corresponding elements added together and it has solved our unary minus problem here, hasn't it? Because, because it's a proper mathematical expression and when Maxima produces LaTeX, it doesn't write minus, uh, plus minus one. And then if we want to evaluate that with simplification, then we just, we just simplify C and that will give us our our work solution, right? So this is the way that you create a step-by-step -step work solution. Now, of course, I didn't just sit down and write that. It took me a little bit of fettling about to get my lambda expression correct and what I wanted to do, which is why I've put it in the docs so that you can do that and similar things in the future. So um, please let's share these, these kinds of ways of doing things because it really does save time. If you spent half an hour with something that you think is likely to be useful in many other situations, then please let me have it. Um, you can either email it to me or you can um, just, um, you, can, you can edit it, the code is on GitHub. So you can edit the docs on GitHub and I will get a pull request uh, and that's very easy to do and much appreciated, right? So um, share those. 
Right, so that's me up to time, and that is me, um, that is me with all the things that I wanted to just say about Maxima. So I thought we would um, set a little workshop task to see how much of this has sunk in and give you, give you all something to do. Okay, is that reasonable? Any questions before we, we explain the workshop task? No, great. Okay, Malta, are you going to explain the workshop task or shall I push on and do that? No, I'd be happy to do so. So right. yeah, um, right. So we've set up this, this question authoring area. Some of you may be familiar with it if you've done workshops with us before. And if you, this, this link is all in the, in the, the, the course page we're on, on the resources. And if you go there and you enroll with the key stack 2020, then you'll be signed up as teachers, which means that you can edit and create questions. Um, and we're going to be doing this, this activity here, right? So we're going to be navigating to the area and then under the question bank, I've created a category for this workshop. And there's a question that you'll be working on in little groups. Okay. Now the really important thing is that um, you're going to be working in, in, in separate groups. Okay. So you want to duplicate the question and you want to give your question a unique name. Okay. Cause we can't be working on um, simultaneous questions with the same name. Right. So, so maybe, maybe duplicate the question and put your own name in there or something else you find sensible. Um, and the task is to write uh, a work solution kind of in, in, in the vein of what Chris has been, been showing you. Okay. So I'll just take you through the steps. We go to the question authoring area. You enroll with Squ stack 2020. Okay. And this is our question authoring area. And, and there's some, some kind of warnings here, which are, um, try not to work on the same question at the same time. Okay. Stack is really not built for editing one question with multiple editors at the same time. And the other thing is that, that, um, once the blue moon, we, um, we clean up this question authoring area and we delete all the questions. So this is not the place to put questions that you want to keep forever. So if you have any questions from today, any stack questions you want to keep, um, you should, you should export them and save them on your own computer. Okay. But the task is down here under the question bank. And we're going to go to the category called Maxima workshop. Right. I see roof is already, already getting started. So I've created this dot product task for you to duplicate and work on. And I'll just show you what it looks like. We've got two vectors and vectors are represented as, as matrices. Malta, can I? Matrices. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you may not have noticed there, but you didn't actually duplicate that. No, I did not. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I should show that as well. Uh, okay. I wasn't sure whether you intended to duplicate it or not, because it's very easy for the mouse to hover <laughs> and you edit it. And when you duplicate it, it will say copy. So yeah, can you just I probably, show, yeah, I probably should do that. Yeah. So I'll duplicate this question. And then if this is going to be my, my copy, then I'll probably call this MS for Meltas Boring. And now this is my copy to work on. Right. And we've got two vectors. And the question is that we're, we're finding the dot product and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very simple, easy question, but it doesn't have any work feedback. So we want to find a step-by-step -step solution for finding the dot product, right? So you want something like, uh, we take two of them, we multiply corresponding elements and then we add them all up. Okay. And so, so you might want to use things like sip with and apply and, and all this sort of stuff Chris has been working on. Okay. Is that fair to, fair to everyone? Um, I'll put you in breakout groups of around four. Um, maybe what I'd suggest is that you pick one person in the group to share their screen. And then that, that can be kind of the golden copy that you, um, you discuss. And then if you want to kind of copy along on your own copy, that's, that's good as well. Okay. Any questions about that? Or is that, that task clear? Okay. Brilliant. Um, we'll take around 10 minutes or so, be back around four 
and Chris, George, and I will, will hop between you if you have any, any problems. All right. That is them open now. Uh, start the recording. Let me find my cheat notes. <laughs> Right, so here was our suggestion, was that, um, first of all, was that we have our, our vectors are hidden in this, in this matrix operator. The matrix is the operator. And we want to eventually zip with uh, multiplication and adding, so we want to turn it into a list. And there are a couple of ways to do it. The one that, that we thought of was, well, first of all, the matrix a uh, vector is a column matrix. First of all, we want to turn it into a, uh, a single row matrix, a single row. We take the arguments of that. That's going to give us a list with a single element, which is a, the, the, the first row. So that gives us the vector. And we just take the first element of that. OK? Turn it into a row. Turn that into a list of arguments, which is a list of the row and just take the first row, gives us that as a list. Um, Sam came up with another method. Uh, he had a function, what was it called, Sam? I don't know, everything I've written in the last 10 minutes seems to have failed spectacularly, so I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know if you're trying to make an example of me for having done something stupid or whether. <laughs> no, no, you, you had a way to turn a list of lists into lists, right? We had a way to. Yeah, there was, it's called flatten. You came, yeah. into, uh, you came into our group with that, uh, with that tip, and it works beautifully. Yeah. So the, danger, the danger with flatten is that it, it flattens all the levels. So if your matrix yeah. entries are lists, then you've now flattened everything. So that's, it's fine in this case, mm -hmm. but that's yeah. the difference. Is there, is there a way to specify which levels I want flattened? I don't, I don't believe so, sorry. But you could write that, right? I mean, you can just write a function that applies flatten to the nested argument. So then you can have what Mathematica would call a level spec. It may already exist in Maxima, right? Somebody may have already written that. That's the problem. One of the problems with Maxima is that over the last half century, there has been a certain amount of duplication and different naming conventions. And so... I've certainly done that myself in Stack. I've written functions only for the maxima people to say, oh, by the way, it's called <laughs> something else. We had, a, we had uh, there's a Scottish word, stushy. Is that right, George? Indeed. Stushy. So there was a bit of a stushy over row add and add row uh, a few years ago, which was a bit of a nightmare. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, point is, we, we've, we've turned this, this matrix into a list of the elements by whichever method that you liked. And now the next thing is that we're gonna take each of the, the corresponding elements, we're gonna multiply them together, okay? So we're zipping the first, the list of the first elements with the list of the elements of the second vector, and we're zipping them with multiplication, okay? So that gives us a list of um, first element of the first vector multiplied, first element of the second vector, and so on and so on. And then you can do apply, to turn, for that, that the operator would be list and the arguments would be all the multiples. You can apply plus to replace um, the, the, the list operator with the add operator. And that would give you the, the sum of the multiples. And if you've done all of this with simplification off and you're showing as you're work, working out, first do T1, then do T2, that's gonna show all the, all the parts of that step. And then for our final answer, we do the same thing, except we evaluate the expressions. Or maybe in this case, actually I think in this case, Chris was thinking the next step would be to show, evaluate the, the binary multiplications and show them being added up. And then as our final step, we would just have the simplified answer. So that would be one way of doing all the steps. I think a lot of you just took it to this step, just showing we're summing up the multiples and that's all, all fine as well, isn't it? Um, right. Yeah, Sam. 
would there be any sense in defining something which just displayed uh, row vectors as columns? Because I think it's quite common to want to display it as a column, but it's often just most helpful to always have it stored as a row. Um, and then you don't have to mess around with permanently transposing and trying to flatten out inner lists. Um, not internally, but um, the way you could immediately do that is, uh, can I share my screen? So I, I've copied and pasted what Malta's talking about. And we've got our, so the first expression was our, so we've got our sum of products. Then we evaluate the product. That internal simplification is done here. Right, so that's evaluating the list. It's simplifying the list, which is the list of products. And then we get our, we get our kind of extra step-by-step -step work solution. Okay, so, um, so what do you want to call the function, Sam? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm thinking of that just as like a display function, right? So, dispvec. Right, but then your operator will always be dispvec. Is that what you want? No, I'm saying I want to not store v1 in that form ever, and then have a have a function which just displays to the to the students something okay. as a column vector. Right. So you want to do something. You want to create a new data type called a display vector, right? No, I just I just want I just want v1 and v2 to be. To, I want you to just remove the inner lists from v1 and v2. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. And then, and then always treat them as if they were row vectors and then have a, have a stack function, which if you want students to see it as a column vector, then just displays it as a column vector. Okay. So, um, what was the question? The question was, uh, I guess. Transport. I mean, I guess it's just transpose. <laughs> That's and then right. Yeah. Okay. Maybe That's I'm where I was going, George. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, that'd probably do it. Yeah. But this is a good. This is a good discussion because you know there are. Um, you know when you when you there's there is a lot of fettling about here, isn't there? Right. There's a lot of fettling about to get the, the, the data type in the way that we can then do that. So there may be ways of either uh, rewriting the question so that the, the things you're manipulating are easier to manipulate. And then we sort out the display later on. Or we come up with some other kind of data type. And we've certainly we've certainly expanded stack to include data types for this kind of reason. Um, or you could do it on a question by question basis and in include a, a function. I was about to define a function in my question that would do this kind of transformation and display, right? So all of those things are possible. Should we, any other comments about that? There's a lot to learn and there are a few tricks of the trade and it takes a while to get the mindset in. But the, the, the fundamental thing here, please, is to try and solve the problem at a mathematical level and to try not to solve it by concatenating latex strings together. That's what I really, that's the message here really. Um, and I think once you get the mindset, it's not so terrifying. I mean, George and Constantina, do you want to say anything about that? Because you've worked with me in Edinburgh for a few years. Um, yeah, I think it's, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you've got a few examples and a few ways of working, um, you know, a little goes a long way, actually. And once you get into that way of doing it, it does save a lot of time in the long run. Um, so I've, I've got some examples that I can maybe share um, shortly where, you know, I didn't even have random versions in the question, but I was using Maxima to do the display because I didn't want to sit and write out all the LaTeX. Um, it gets to that point when you know what you're doing, um, it's easier to do that than to type out the LaTeX. Sam, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, sorry, I know I keep interrupting with questions. Uh, in terms of that method, uh, sorry, um, thinking about always trying to get your answer as, uh, as something in Maxima and then just display the Maxima variable. I, I came across the problem for a course the other day of trying to do some complex numbers and getting them to display with the real part first. And after about an hour of trying, just gave up on the problem. Has anyone found a fix for this? I can see everyone laughing, which means they've either... Yeah, Constantina should maybe speak to this one. <laughs> No, I think that that's my main issue for years now that I always complain to Chris about that. Okay. I think you can find different work, work around it, but yes. So, so this is definitely a case where we probably need a stack function which treats a complex number as a single thing. Because at the moment, a complex number is a sum of, it's an expression, right? So at some level, maxima, if you think about where this comes in an expression tree, maxima, um, Maxima puts this in an expression tree as a sum of a real part and an imaginary part. And the imaginary part is the product of a number and I, or maybe it's just I, I don't know, right? And do you want to type, do you want to see one times I or just I? I mean, there's all these kinds of questions. So at some level, it's an expression tree. So we can have, and we probably should have, a, a function complex that takes two arguments. But then all the simplification algorithms will have to remove that when you want to remove it. You'll have to remember to remove that function. So when you simplify, you'll have to turn the complex number function back into one plus three i, or it won't simplify it further. So there is a trade-off between having these inert functions and then having to remove them. But does this help you with display? Right, well, well we, just, we, we define uh, the, the complex function doesn't really do anything, but the tech knows how to display a complex function. Right? So when you, when you ask for the LaTeX of an expression, right? So at the moment, the matrix function is a prefix operator, matrix, and it has lists, doesn't it? But then when it's displayed, it's displayed as a grid with whatever. So there are... Yeah. But it's the unary minus that kills you, right? It's it's trying to it's trying to display the the two components and not end up with plus minus i. Well, that will be the problem when we define a uh, uh, yeah yeah. I think complex numbers has has been a tricky area, and I've got an example on that as well. Um, maybe we should move on. 